songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty town. Your name is a shelter like no world. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. We're going to be uh, having our kids. They're going to be singing and some bells and all sorts of cool stuff in just a few minutes. So if you guys can continue to draw forward a little bit and squeeze in, we're going to have a few extra people. Uh, they'll be starting in about five minutes. Five minutes. And our kids will be having a wonderful time here to sing to you and you and you and you. We're looking forward to it. Thanks for being here. Okay, it's time for all the littles. If one of your littles has been practicing with Miss Beth, it's time to come on up onto the stage and sing. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? No, hello. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning, yay. <laughs> For those of you who have children who are singing, we need them all up on stage, please. We have the younger group right here in front of us. We have the older group that's doing the handbells to go after them. So I just wanted to give a few notes about this morning. We're very excited about the kids' choir. I just want to thank Miss Beth and her helpers for putting this on. <laughs> she deserves much more than an applause. She um, makes this happen. So thank you, Miss Beth. Um, child care will be open today, but not until after the kids sing. The nursery and the two-year-old rooms will be in the same um, rooms that they typically are, just through this hallway. The threes and up, because of the um, closure of the gym, threes and up are going to be in the school building. For those who have been checked in already, they need to be, after the performance, they need to be brought over to the school building where Michaela will greet you. She'll check off their names that they've already been checked in, and then they'll go to the playground. For those who have not been checked in, please bring them to the check-in station right here outside of the lobby so we can get them checked in, and then they can go over to the school building as well. We uh, have had a busy week. <laughs> There's a lot of sicknesses going around, so um, unfortunately we can't have as many kids as we typically do, um, but we're trying to make that work. So um, hopefully most of the kids have been checked in, and um, yeah, they're going to have fun. They're going to sing, they're going to play in the playground, and then they're going to have a lesson in a game after their performance. So I just wanted to give those notes to you all, and I hope you all enjoy. <laughs> So the first couple of songs are kind of Palm Sunday-ish, you know, King of Kings and praising him, riding on the donkey. But they've been working on uh, the whole armor of God. So we're going to do that a cappella. And the Lord is my shepherd, all of Psalm 23. So they've been learning it. It's pretty cool. And sign language. So thank you. There's no name higher, there's no one greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, He is the King. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
Your little ones are coming back to you now. Please find them.
Give it up for the children's choir. They did such a great job. Let's also encourage Miss Beth Costa. Give it up for Miss Beth Costa. As the band comes up, we're going to reset. Uh, again, your children are coming to you. They're older, so hopefully they can find you, but make sure, please. I uh, want to welcome you. If you're a first-time guest, this isn't every Sunday, uh, although that might be interesting, opening up every Sunday with the children's choir. Um, it's Palm Sunday, so we have a tradition of having the children come up and begin our worship. Um, so we're excited that you're here. We're, we're uh, inviting you to be a part of the service and participate. Uh, so the band will be uh, setting up now, and then we'll, we'll get started. Good morning, y'all can stand. Let's worship the Lord together. Father, we thank you that we get to come and sing your praise, and that in eternity we'll be singing it over and over and over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We welcome you into this place, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. So as I said earlier, if you're a first-time guest, uh, we want to welcome you. We don't believe it's by accident that you're here. Um, we have these little cards in the seat back pockets. They're connect cards. Um, we'd love for you to fill one of those out and let us know that you've attended, that you've come, and gives us the, us the opportunity to reach out to you. Um, if you are uh, online, you're watching online, welcome. Uh, we welcome you to engage in the service. Um, we also have a, a digital connect card on the website, so if you'd like to fill that out, we'd love to reach out to you. Um, you can also give us your prayer requests if there's something going on in your life. Um, let me rephrase that. Um, as there is something going on in your life, we'd love to participate and believe in God for you uh, and with you. So feel free to fill that out. 
Um, tithes and offerings can be dropped in the black boxes on the uh, back of the sanctuary on the walls. Um, so you can do that. Lydia Farmer, the, the legend, is going to come. It's the first time I've gotten legend. Do I like it? I don't know. It's okay. Okay. Better next week. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you all. Um, I just have a few announcements. Um, today is Second Sunday, so um, if you brought a lunch or if you didn't, we would just love to hang out with you guys after service. So um, we'd love for you to stick around. You can go grab something and then come back, but we'll be out at the picnic tables um, in the sunshine, and it'll be nice. Your, all your kids can play on the playground also. Um, this coming Friday, the 15th, is Good Friday. So excited about it. Ralph, you're teaching, right? Yeah, Ralph's going to be teaching. Um, it's at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. There won't be any child care, so it's a family service, so everybody's come, come just an hour, 6.30 to 7.30. Um, we'd love to have you come worship with us. Um, and then next Sunday's Easter Sunday. I'm so excited. Um, yes, we're going to have one service still at our normal time, 10 a.m., um, there will be child care, so come early, get your ch kids checked in. Um, for everybody who is like a normal attender who's here like every week, we want y'all to like squeeze into the front rows. So we, as we have like guests, family members, um, there'll be like room in the back for them as they, if people come in late. Um, so just squeeze in. We're all a family. We love each other. So these rows are going to be your friends, okay? All right. See y'all next week. I'm excited. Thank you, Lydia. Well, we're going to enter back into worship, and I'm excited. Um, I wanted to share a little bit, uh, very briefly, of what God's been doing in my heart uh, recently. I feel like the Lord's really been changing my heart. Uh, he's been giving me a, a new hunger for his word, a uh, hunger for his presence um, for him. And it's been interesting because at the same time that the spiritual appetite shift is happening. I'm also having a physical appetite shift that I'm having to go through. And um, I'm having to choose new foods. And uh, new to me, most humans eat these types of foods. <laughs> but I, you know, it, it's difficult to eat things that you aren't necessarily hungry for. And so sometimes you just have to eat it. And it may not be your favorite thing, but you begin the process. You take a step and you start just, I'm going to eat this. I know it's good for me. I know it's good for me. I'm going to eat it. And so that's kind of what's been going on. Um, I feel like the Lord has given me a hunger for his word in a new way, um, which is something I've desired for a long time. And just, just feasting on his word. His word is food. You know, Jesus, Jesus is the word. The word was in the beginning. Um, he is the food. And, and you know, we're, we're called to feast on it. We're called to eat it and consume it and meditate on it. And so I feel like God's given me freedom in that in a new way. And it reminded me a little bit. Of, my grandfather spent much of his uh, career working for the Southern Railroad. And he was actually a bridge engineer. And engineers are important. Um, when you're designing a bridge for anything, let alone a train, you want to make sure that thing will hold up. It takes a lot of weight, a lot of force. And uh, I, I, I didn't actually know how much trains weighed, so I looked it up. Um, there's a lot of different weights, but they can weigh over 20,000 tons, a train. And they can pull 100 rail cars, which seems like a lot. But it reminds me, you know, with sort of my struggle, spiritually, physically, emotionally. It's impossible for us to move that 20,000 ton train on our own power. We cannot do it. There's not enough desire. There's not enough discipline. There's not enough anything in us to move that thing. We can't even budget. But the interesting thing about a train is it has a very powerful engine. And I believe that engine for us is the Holy Spirit. And you know, it takes so much force to get that train just to move a few feet. But, but once you get it moving, 
it starts picking up speed. And as that power, as that power continues to flow through it and, and, and drive it, how many of you know it's difficult to stop a train at 60 miles an hour? Those little things, those little just nuisances or it might, be, it might be big things. It might be persecution. It might be adversity. It might be very difficult challenges. But when you're doing 60 on a train, you've got a lot of momentum. And I believe that spiritual momentum is really what I want to share with you. I've sensed a spiritual momentum in my life that I haven't in quite some time. And I was honestly surprised by it, which is so sad but true. Here I am eating the spiritual food that I know is good for me and I know is right in a more significant way, and I'm denying myself of the other types of things I want to engage in my time, entertainment, YouTube, whatever it may be, and I'm choosing Jesus, I'm choosing God, I'm choosing the scripture, and I'm feeding myself, and within a small amount of time, I can start to see the fruit. I can start to see it, and it's building, and that spiritual momentum is building in me. And I believe, that, I believe that today is the day that you can begin developing that spiritual momentum. And it, you know, the first bite of that food that I don't like to eat is not fun. It just isn't. And you might feel that way about the Word of God. You might feel like you don't understand it or you, it seems dry to you or whatever you might feel about it. But I'm here to tell you that the Word of God is living and active it is sharper than a two-edged sword. It does not return void. It does that for which it was sent. And if you don't even know all the things that I'm saying or it doesn't make sense, I'm just telling you there's a mystery about the word. It is active. And when we engage in it, it changes us. It changes our heart. It changes our mind. It changes our actions. And the best part, the very best part, is that it actually starts moving into the other areas of our lives. It starts spreading. And, you know... I, Discipline is, it's contagious. You start doing something, a little bit of discipline, all of a sudden it just starts flowing into other areas. I start picking up trash I would have never picked up. You start doing things a little bit extra for your spouse. You start doing a little bit more than you were doing before. And so my encouragement to us and continue to myself is take that step, whatever that spiritual discipline is that may be you've been lacking in or you've shelved for a while or or maybe you've just got something new that, that God's drawing you to I would just encourage you to engage in it the Lord wants to change your heart and change your mind and keep renewing it and making it more like him and I promise as as he moves in your life you will begin to feel that power of the Holy Spirit it's not you it's him and he will begin to change your life so let's stand with that and let's we're gonna worship I'm going to pray for us. God of the universe, you are powerful. You are everywhere. You are all-knowing. You know us. You know everything about us. You knew everything we were going to do before we were even born or formed in our mother's womb. Before we were born, Lord, you knew us. And you picked us anyway, in spite of all of our sin and all of our mistakes and all of our areas of weakness, all the things we're struggling with and still working out and failing regularly. You knew all of it, and you came for us, and you keep coming for us, and you love us. Thank you that you are a good father. Thank you that you are a great God, a mighty God, a warrior God. Thank you that you are the one who fights our battles. No matter what adversity we face, in the middle of a war, you are the one, Jesus, who fights for us. You are the one. It's your power. It's your glory. It's your fame. Help us, Father, to live for you. Help us, Jesus, to worship you in spirit and in truth today. Change our hearts. Prick our hearts, Lord Jesus. Resensitize our hearts and our minds. Unsear our consciences, Father. Help us to forget things that we've seen that we shouldn't have. Help us to forget things that we've heard that we shouldn't have. 
Help us to stop believing the lies of the enemy who wants to come and deceive us. He wants to come and kill and steal and destroy us, our peace and our joy and our hope and all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that you bring. You bring life and life abundantly. Today, Father, I pray today is the day of freedom. Today is the day of freedom. Today is the day of salvation for us, Jesus. We welcome you into this place, Father. We say we are yours. We are yours. Do whatever you want to do. Have your way. We love you. Receive this worship, Father, as we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. I want to read y'all Revelation 5, 11 to 13. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. So we're joining with that this morning. That's what we're singing with. That's who we're singing to, the Lamb.
play for a minute. Let's just close your eyes and let's just thank him. Just from your heart, just invite him here. We invite you here, Holy Spirit. We're here for you. We're here for you, Jesus. Take away all our distractions. Let's just take a couple minutes and just, just connect. Just welcome him. Stay there for a minute. Let's just stay there for just a minute. Let's linger.
something special about just being in his presence that's unlike anything else we can do or anywhere else we can be. Lord, we sit at your feet. We didn't earn a seat. We, 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 didn't, we didn't work hard and then you decided to pick us. While we were still in our sin, you saw us, you knew us, and you reached down and you grabbed a hold of our hand and said, come with me, child. Thank you for that kind of salvation, Father. Thank you for that kind of love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that you give us the ability to sense you and feel you close. We worship you, Jesus. Have your way in the service. Have your way in our hearts and our lives. We love you, Father. a seat. We have the joy of Brother Ralph coming to preach to us today. Yes, it's very exciting. And Lee is going to come and share uh, some verses with us and read in just a moment. So Ralph will be up just a second. Morning, church. Um, I'm going to be reading from the ESV, John 15, verses 18 through John 16, verse 4a. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would not love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you will and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big round of applause. And let's thank those kids for a great presentation this morning. Wow, what energy. What energy. Well, good morning, church. I said good morning, church. That's what we like to hear. You know... I have no other place that I'd rather be than right here with you all this morning. In the midst of so much turmoil in this world, we are here worshiping the only true God in spirit and in truth. Yes, you should pray. You need a little, excuse me, I'm, my tongue's a little tied a little bit. We need a little bit of that energy like the kids this morning. Yes. We get to worship God, yes. We get to sing praises to the Father, yes. What an, what an example for us as adults that these children have put before us. You know, I'm a little troubled. So what I'm going to do is I want to pray a prayer before we begin because 
I just want to want us, I want you to agree with me this morning, Christians, those of you who know the Lord, let's bind Satan, let's bind his deception, and let's exalt our Savior Jesus Christ this morning. So let's do that right now, okay? Let's just bow our heads. We can do that. Father, we ask you now, by the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that this morning in this worship experience where your children have come together to lift you up and to praise you, that you would bind all the evil spirits and that people here would only hear your word, your truth, for your glory and their good. For we pray in Jesus' name and amen. amen. Now, I will say one thing about Friday night. It's going to be a great experience. It's only going to be for an hour. We're going to talk about the Passover, and we're going to talk about John chapter 13. We're going back in John chapter, to John chapter 13, and we're going to share some insights in that passage of Scripture. It's going to, you will be blessed, I will just tell you right now. So come. It's only going to be for an hour. We are going to do the Lord's Supper, but we're going to have some other things that are just going to give you deeper insight into what God had to say in His Word. Okay? Y'all good with that? If you are, say amen. amen. Got it. There we go. In his book, Living Insights, Chuck Swindoll makes a very interesting comment. He says, we in the United States of America no longer live in a Christian nation. I dare say, we do not even live in a post-Christian nation. I am now convinced more than ever that we live in an anti-Christian nation. When did the tide shift, he asked? Well, he says, no one can say for certain. But when political correctness forbids humor at the expense of anyone except Christians and popular culture finds blasphemy entertaining, a flood of persecution will soon follow. History has taught us that much. Look at me for a minute. What is it about our present culture that has taken the boldness from many who are, in, uh, who are a part of the church? Now, I want you to, I've got, a, I've got a few questions I want you to take out on the back porch, and you've got your washing machine out there on the back porch, and I want you to put it in that washing machine, and I want you to let it agitate for just a minute, okay? What is it about our present culture that has taken the boldness from many who are part of the church? Why? Why are so many people hesitant to speak out for God's truths in the workplace and in society in general. I love reading books from these older ministers who've gone on for years ago, some just a few years ago. I was reading one by uh, James Montgomery Boyce, who was a pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church, so I'm just assuming by the 10th that there were 10, nine other Presbyterian churches in Philadelphia. You know, I don't know. But he had this to say, and I thought it was because, honestly, he was asking the, pretty much the same things that I just asked you. Listen to what he said. Why is today's church so weak? Why are we able to claim so many conversions and enroll so many church members, but have less and less impact on our culture? Why are Christians indistinguishable from the world? Now, I, I really wanted that quiet, so you would think about that. I want you to meditate on that departure. He also prepared them for reality. 
And that reality was that there would be conflict. There will be war. And that reality that was there in the days that Jesus, before he went to the cross and after the cross, those days are here now for us. From the very beginning of his public ministry, Jesus began preparing his disciples for the persecution that they would face as they continue to spread his gospel. If you go back and study the book of John, I love preaching from the book of John. I probably preached more sermons out of the book of John when I was a pastor than any other book in the Bible. If you go back and you study all these chapters in John, John chapter 3 tells us that he used the metaphor of light versus darkness. Over and over again, he spoke of the battle between the kingdom of God and the world system which is ruled by Satan. Paul described it this way. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, now listen, Christian. Look around this room. You in the balcony, look down, look across, look up. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We are fighting a battle in an unseen realm. And that battle, just like the war that we are seeing in Ukraine today, because we are not, we are not unfamiliar with wars. We see that battle going on in Ukraine, and we see these updates every day of these horrendous atrocities that have been laid against the people of Ukraine by the Russian army, and we shudder. But I want to tell you something about wars. At the very heart of any conflict, there is the issue of control whether that control is of land, resources, or people. It's all about control. And as Christians, our battles have eternal ramifications. Now, I'm going to lay some heavy stuff on you. I want you to look around the people that came with you today. The battle that Satan is waging against them is for your spouse, for your friends, for your children, for your grandchildren. He wants control so that he can look at God and say, (laughs) I deceived them. This one is mine. That's why it's so important that we understand what Jesus did for us today. Because in this scripture, Jesus, who is the ultimate commander. Now, I just want you to, just to get you a little up a little bit. Say he's the ultimate commander. The ultimate commander. Ah, that's pitiful. <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate commander. Yes, now give him a round of applause. He prepares his disciples and us for the conflict that is common to all Christians. Two weeks ago, Chris, there you are, right over here. Chris explained to us the importance of abiding in Christ. And this abiding produces fruit in our lives. He told us that Jesus, in that passage that Chris explained, beautifully explained the joy that he had in abiding in the Father. And he pointed to the truth. And listen, this is important. He pointed to the truth. 
that we can experience the same joy as we abide in Him. Now, I am very sorry, and I pr- I'll pray for you if you're not a happy Christian. I am. I, you know, I've got a lot to be thankful for. If you had been through just a part of what I have been through, you would be running up and down the aisle shouting and saying, I don't care what anybody says about it. I am thankful that Jesus saved me. Amen. That he redeemed me. Sometimes we have to go through some very, very deep, dark struggles in order to appreciate what we have. And I've been through some tough struggles. And all it has done is just polish my love and my adoration and my praise for my Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus spent much of his time emphasizing this. The importance of loving God. The importance of loving his word. Of finding joy in living for him and bearing fruit. Amen? Yes. Now as we come to the second half of John chapter 15... And I noticed you listened as your wife was reading. You're a very smart man. You're right on the edge of your seat. The message that Jesus is delivering to his disciples shifts from love. The first part of John is about love to hate. The second part about hate. And I'm amazed at how Jesus transitions this emphasis here. Now, now listen to verse 18 and 19 in John chapter 15. He says, if the world hates you, know, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, have, would love you as, your, as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now the world, we know, is this fallen system which operates according to Satan's values and is subject to the curse of sin. But let me tell you something. When you go back and you study all the books of the Bible and you study the creation account, it wasn't just the crown of creation that Satan came and wanted to destroy. It was creation itself. He wanted everything. He wanted it all. That's what we read and find out in the Bible. When he said, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High, and I will be like the Most High. And then the battle in heaven, he was cast out. And where did he have to go? But on God's creation that he made for you and for me to destroy this world and to destroy you. He hates you and me. And he has infiltrated this world system and has filled it full of lies and deception and has brought many people to hell because of that. Now, because he presents this modern dilemma of the Christian in such a nutshell of a, of a phrase, I'm going to quote Chuck Swindoll again. Listen to what he says. If you're unsure of this, go to places of higher learning or seek out captains of industry or stand before political powers and then present the gospel of Jesus Christ and watch as their tolerance fades. Yeah, some of you nodding your head. You've been there. I remember one time years ago, I went to work for this coal company and it had a lot of employees Man, I mean, we would have these Christmas dinners. And they were three, four hundred people there, you know. And, and everybody knew I was, you know, I was a Christian. I shared the gospel. I t- I'm, I'm just me. I can't help but be me. So the president comes and says, uh, Ralph Farley, would you come up and bless the food, you know, before you take it? Well, sure. I'd be glad to stand up and witness, you know, say a prayer for Jesus, you know. Well, that went good. 
And then one day, someone comes to me and said, uh, so-and-so said that you really need to tone it down. I said, there ain't no toned down knob in my life. And one time somebody comes and said, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to be a preacher or a coal miner. I said, that, that decision is easy. I'm a preacher. I'm a, I'm a child of God. It happens in industry, in places of learning. Even back in 1969 when I started college, I remember going to the religion class and the guy was going off on some crazy. And I, did, I wasn't entrenched in the word, but I knew better than what he was saying. And I said, no, 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 that's not quite, oh, yes, it is. Now, if you're going to pass this class, this is what it is. Already that bent was there. So, brothers and sisters, listen. Let me, let, before we go any further, I just want to reiterate this contrast that Jesus put before us in chapter 15. Because I think it's important we grasp this. And for the sake of time, just allow me to paraphrase. Okay? And if you don't say okay, I'm going to do it anyway. So, our Lord was stressing that when we abide in Him, listen, this is so important. We have His peace and His joy. Amen? Amen. Both of these things produce within us His love for the Father and for our fellow man. Now, as a little exercise this morning, take your left hand and raise it up to the Father and just reach out and touch someone with your right hand. That's what the love of God, when we abide in Him, that's what His peace and His joy gives us. Love for the Father and love for our fellow man. We can't have love for our fellow man without love for the Father first. We've got to get the vertical right before we get to work on the horizontal. The world is working on the horizontal. Oh, we can all coexist. We can all do this. You know, you've got to accept this. You've got to accept that. No. When I get this right, then he will tell me what is right here. See? But because of that love and that peace and that joy within me, because of me abiding in Jesus Christ, I have the love for the Father and love for my fellow man. John chapter 15, verse 8, reports this, that Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. How do we know we have love for the Father? Because we love our fellow man, not by our own ability, but by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Am I able to love? Now, continuing with this metaphor of fruit, because we have peace and joy, we have fruit. Love for the Father, love for our fellow man. Now, he continues with this metaphor of fruit, and Jesus tells his disciples and us in verses 18 through 24. Now listen, this is important, that the fruit of hatred is persecution. Do you get that? Look at what Jesus said here. John chapter 15, verse 18 again. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And then in John chapter 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Now, brothers and sisters, this union that we have with Jesus Christ constitutes a community of love. Remember, love the Father, love the fellow man. Because of that, we have a community of love. And that community stands in direct opposition to the world system. Amen? Now, in Luke chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said this, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
What does that mean? Well, if you were living during the time that the Romans would take over any area and you saw a group of Roman soldiers coming and a man carrying or a woman carrying their cross, you would say that person is going to die. And what Jesus is telling us is that we are to die every day to self. Because there's a choice that has to be made for the Christian. You accepted Jesus Christ, now I've got to choose to live for Jesus Christ. Right? Oh, yeah. There's this ability to make a choice. You make the choice every day. Paul put it this way. He said, I beseech you, brothers. I'm going to use the King James Version here. I beseech you, brothers, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, which is your reasonable service. So every day, we pick up our cross, we die to self, and we live for Him. That's what He's saying. Now, you might be sitting here saying, well, you know, I don't know about that, Ralph. That's a, that's a little extreme. Well, let's put it this way then. The decision to not follow Christ means that you're siding with a lost and hateful world. There's no middle ground, folks. There will come a time when you will be pushed to a place where you have to make a decision. I've been there. I know. There comes a time when you say, no, 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 I can't do this. I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm a Christian. My Savior died on the cross for me, and he told me to pick up my cross and die daily. And John goes on in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, and says this. I mean, John carries this theme throughout all of his books. He says, do not be surprised, brother, that the world hates you. Some of you are sitting out there and something happened. You said, I can't believe they did that. What would you do? I stood up for Jesus. Hello? Just rejoice in it. And thank him for it. And go on. Because he will provide the power that you need. Now, that brings us down to something that's very important. It's clear to me, and I hope it is to you, that Jesus' abrupt mention of the Holy Spirit in verses 26 and 27 was very purposeful. So here we go from love to hate. They're going to hate you because they hated me, and you're my servant, and the servant is not greater than the the master, so get ready. But then he says this emphasis, that the Holy Spirit will come to you. So what did Jesus want us to know? What what was he telling us here? Well, he wanted us to know the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And for the believer, that role of the Holy Spirit was to provide supernatural courage in the face of opposition. We had this old preacher one time. He said, seek or swim, live or die. I'm with Jesus. Which meant that regardless of what happens in my life, I'm with Jesus. If it kills me, I'm with Jesus. And the only way that one can do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because your spirit would be, ooh, I'm okay, don't kill me, I'm with you. Now, we have not seen persecution in America. But we are going to see it. Turn on your TV. Open the news. If you still get a newspaper, I don't know if you can. Whatever, however you get your news, you'll see it. All the things that the world is wanting you to accept and to change your mentality and thinking and accept. And if you don't accept it, guess what? You don't go along with their agenda, 
then you're on the outs. Persecution is finally coming to the West. When I was a little boy growing up, I told my mom, I said, Mom, I want to be a movie star. She said, yeah, forget that. She said, that's Gomorrah over there on the West Coast and on the East Coast is Sodom. And you're not going to be a part of either one of those. Well, guess what? Sodom and Gomorrah has now infiltrated all the states of America. Satan knows that his time is short and that he is trying to get as many on his way as he can. And he wants to thwart God's plan and purpose for you and mankind. Because let's face it, life's not easy. Anybody in here going through a battle? Let's put it this way. Anybody in here going into a battle or in a battle or coming out of a battle? Because that's what life is like. Every day that we wake up, we are in a battle. Our opposition. We even, who would ever thought that Christians would be depressed? Right? Who would have thought that? Well, we are. So what do we do when we face these things? Well, the right response is to turn to God. Pray for God's guidance. Pray for His presence. Pray for His joy. Pray for His delight. Because it is on you. It is for you, Christian. Paul said this in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And unless you've been through some very dark and very stressful times, you don't appreciate that glory. Later on, in, Paul said in verse 26 of chapter 8, he said, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Look at me. Wake up. Russ, John, Chris, and I, we've been preaching through the book of John, and we have told you over and over and over again that God will not leave you as an orphan. That's not his plan. He comes to you. He gave us the Holy Spirit to live within us. He said, I will give you the Comforter who is one like me, like my Heavenly Father who will be in you. After he defeated death on the cross, after he defeated Satan on the cross for your soul and my soul, he spent time with his disciples instructing them and teaching them for a short period of time. And then he ascended into the heavenlies and is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me. And on the day of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to be within us and to empower us to live this victorious life. No matter what is going on in your life, and there are some of you here that are going through a, like a big caterpillar truck full of garbage just dumped right on you, and you go, how am I going to get out of this? You are more than conquerors through him who loves you. Even in the midst of that, in the midst of your depression, you are still more than conquerors through him who loved you in Jesus Christ. You're there. Listen. Let me, let, on this passage here in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. You know what peace is, right? Jesus. 
He said, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Now, that verse, not what Ralph says, but what Jesus just said there in John 16, 33, should have made you say amen. He's my, that's my Lord. That's my Redeemer. That's my Savior. That's the one who died for me. That's Jesus, my one and only hope for eternity. I can't help it if you're all not excited. I am. I'm going to sit down here. And, I'm going to get down here and I'm going to say amen. Amen, Ralph. <laughs> Quoting on this very same text in the book of John. Here's what Spurgeon said. In Jesus himself, there is always peace. If he had not possessed peace, we could not have had peace in him. Now, let that just turn a little bit. If he had not possessed peace, we could not have had peace in him. What a holy calm there was in the spirit of our divine master. He was a master of the art of peace. No man ever had more to disturb him. And I love how he put this sentence together. But no man was less disturbed. He could not be turned aside from anything that he had resolved to do, for he set his face like a flint, and in the doing of it, he could not be excited or discouraged. For his spirit was not of this changing world. Guess what? Guess what, Christian? That's the same spirit in you. The same spirit that we're going to rejoice in next week that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Within you. Now, in light of all this reality of persecution from this world, I know I've... I know I've put some heavy stuff on you, but you need to be aware that persecution is going to come. You know, I, I told you all, I, I played football in high school on a small team, and that coach prepared us for every game. We didn't have videos and all this stuff, but he knew what to expect. He would watch these teams play, and he would meet with us, and he'd say, Ralph, you're playing defensive end. Get ready because they're going to run this sweep play out here, and you've got to cut it off and turn it in. And sure enough, we'd go play this team, and there they'd run that sweep. So I did what all good defensive ends supposed to do, turn the play in. Sometimes I got run over. Most of the time I got run over. But I was prepared for what came. That's what Jesus was doing here. So I want to just rally us for a few minutes on three quick points of encouragement, okay? You all good with that? Okay. First of all, got your pen, got your paper, write it down. First of all, learn to rely upon the Holy Spirit. And realize, listen, this is so important. Realize that reliance upon the Holy Spirit's of a, upon the Holy Spirit is a learn by doing skill. This is what Russ was teaching Wednesday night. He said, You start off with just baby steps, then you're able to walk, then you're able to run. That's as much running as I'm going to do, right? These knees don't run like they used to. So. But when we learn by doing, we exercise that reliance upon him, upon him, and then what the Holy Spirit does is he will provide wisdom. He will provide courage. He will provide all the abilities that we need to meet the situations in life. John 15, 26 says this, But when the Helper comes... Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So what we have here is that the Holy Spirit, the promise of Jesus, 
will provide all that we believers need to faithfully listen, bear witness for Him. Because it's of utmost importance, church, that you and I remember what our mission is. Listen to me. Yes, battling immorality is important, and we will do that. Yes, pursuing social justice is important, and we will do that as well. However, our primary mission is to love Jesus Christ. Lloyd Ogilvie put it this way. He said, the Christian life is essentially a love relationship with Jesus. He is unqualified love. Knowing Him, being filled with His Holy Spirit, and communicating His transforming power should be the purpose and the passion of our lives. And I will go so far as to say this. The only weapon, well, let's put it this way. The greatest weapon against evil, against an ungodly world, is a life transformed by the Spirit of God. You are a light in a dark world. You are a lighthouse shining to those who are out on the ocean dying without a way don't know where to go, but you shine as a light and you bring them to you because of your transformed life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 tells us, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake. Now remember, now notice how Peter said that. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, and do it with gentleness and respect. So what happens? Well, this is what happens. When we get this relationship right, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. Then we can get this relationship right. It's like a volcano. It just starts to ooze out of us and spread out to other places because we have this right and this right. It's not us. It's Him always. Secondly, he tells us to beware of the dangers of being ensnared by evil. Christian, this is very important. Beware of the dangers of being ensnared by evil. John 16, 1 says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Now, I want you to notice something before I get into that verse and explain it a little bit to you. I want you to notice how Jesus, is focus, his focus is shifting from the cause of persecution because they hate you because I, they hated me first. The world hates you because of Jesus. And now you are associated with him and they hate you. The cause of persecution. Now he is shifting to the response of persecution. Now listen, notice here what he's saying. And to better understand this verse, John chapter 16, verse 1, I want us to look at the words falling away in Greek. Okay? Now, the Greek word is pronounced skandalizo. Skandalizo. And from that word, we get these meanings. Fall away, stumble, or take offense. This is the origin of our English word, scandalize. All right? Now, let me explain a little bit to you here about this. Kenneth Weiss translates the word to mean this, to put a stumbling block or an impediment in the way upon which another may trip or fall, 
to cause a person to begin to distrust one whom he ought to trust. It's the same word that Jesus used in Mark chapter 14, verse 27. And when it's not going to be on the screen, but write this verse down, and you'll get a better understanding of what he's meaning here. Jesus used this word when he said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Now, what Jesus is speaking of here is our being caught off guard like an animal that steps in a bear trap. You don't even know what a bear trap is. We get these little traps that we want to catch animals in. And in in West Virginia, we go trapping, not for bears, but for other animals. And we put a trap and cover it up with some leaves so that when the animal, whatever it may be, fox, you know, rabbit, you know, anything, when it stepped on that, it didn't see it, boom, caught him, okay? Or it may be that trap that you see on the cartoons where it's got the little pole here, you know, in the box up, and it's got a little carrot down there. That's the same meaning here. So what Jesus is telling us He is speaking of our being caught off guard like an animal who is in switches and snared in a trap. Now, why is it important that we talk about the love this way and that way? Well, here's why. Because he was encouraging us to abide in his love as we purposefully love one another and help one another walk this Christian life. We're on our way to glory. We are sojourners in this land. We are walking through this wilderness going to our Canaan land. And there are people with us that need our help. Sometimes they can't see the the trap. But you do. So the Lord is telling us, go to them. And if you see your brother stumbling, talk to him. Restore him. Help him. Walk with him so that you together will be victorious in Christ. Amen? Charles Spurgeon said this, As the Master had peace in himself, he had a strong desire that all Christians should have peace. Our Lord Jesus Christ delights to see his people firm, calm, and happy. Let us enjoy the calm of heart that comes from knowing, and this is so important what he said, knowing that the reserves of God are infinite and that at any moment they can come to our aid and deliver us should an emergency occur. When that verse said, my father has cattle on a thousand hills, that was just not to make you think, oh, God, that's something. No, he's my dad. He has resources that he wants to give you, supernatural resources, so that you can be victorious in this life. Third and final point. We have to remember that the persecution which comes from serving the Lord never takes the Lord by surprise. Never takes the Lord by surprise. John 16, 4 tells us, But I have said these things, to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Now, this is a little quote that I got from one of my sermons that I preached many, many years ago. Christians are notorious for remembering what we ought to forget and forgetting what we ought to remember. Now, just think about that for a minute. Christians are notorious for remembering what we ought to forget and forgetting what we ought to remember. Well, church persecution is inevitable. But within this text, John 15, 18 through 16, 4, Christ is teaching us who we are in Him. Surrounded and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, 
my goodness, we are provided with gifts such as perseverance, perspective, creativity, empathy, gratitude, and faithfulness. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit gives us peace and a rest that is only reserved for the child of God. That's why you can sleep in the boat in the midst of a storm. See? That's why when all the world is going to that everywhere in a handbasket, you can stand in peace. You can stand in comfort because you know the one who steals the storm. You know the one who comes in the clouds, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We serve a God who is mighty in power and whose primary purpose is to transform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's who we serve. For those people who love the Lord, He promises a future day when all wrongs will be right. There's an old hymn that says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Let's stand. As the band comes, I want to close with this, another old hymn that should be our heart cry every day. I want you to listen to these words. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. That should be our prayer every day. Brother John is going to come. As we transition into a time of worship in response to uh, what uh, Brother Ralph has spoken this morning, we're going to take uh, communion. So if you don't have your elements in the round table tops behind you, if you could just go ahead and grab those. Um, we're going to celebrate something that's 2,000 years old. It was specifically given to us by Jesus himself on the, last, uh, on the night he was betrayed. This coming Friday night, Jesus implemented this for millennia, and now we're celebrating it right now. Jesus said this is his body and his blood. And it's almost as Jesus was saying, one day I won't physically be here, and you need to remember that I, I was here. I was physical. I came, and I suffered for you, for your sake. This world is dark, as we heard this morning, but we have hope. We have hope. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, I'm going to do a trick. Um, He said, this is my body that was broken for you. I'm just going to pray. And once I'm done praying, and as I'm praying, just bring before the Lord anything that you just need to let him just crucify on the cross. Any sin, any hopelessness, any darkness that you're dealing with, any trials, any bitterness. Maybe you need to reconcile with someone you haven't reconciled with. I'm going to pray, and as I'm praying, just ask the Holy Spirit. Just say, what is it that you're wanting me to crucify right now? Get rid of, die to myself, carry my cross today as we've been encouraged by Brother Ralph this morning to carry. And then once I'm done praying, we're going to eat this bread. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you that on the night that he was betrayed, he didn't sit and worry and blame and accuse and, and say, hey, guys, look out for Judas. Hey, he's coming for me. 
Something bad's about to happen. No, he knew. He knew there was a greater plan and purpose at stake so that he would endure suffering. And it was for my salvation. It was for my forgiveness, for my sins. It was for us. Lord, forgive us of any sins this morning that we're holding on to. And let us eat of this body that you broke and gave us so freely. In Jesus' name, you may eat the body. And on the same night, he took a cup and he said, this is the new covenant. This is a new promise. This is a new um, agreement between God and man. And it was my grace he gave us. It was Jesus' grace. He said, this is my blood. Blood in scripture was a symbol of life being poured out. So every time that, Jesus, that God would look at the blood of Jesus, it would show that sin was paid for and someone's life was given for it. And Jesus said, not in your place, I'll take it. I'll take it. It says in scripture, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Father, we come before you now again, thanking you for this blood that was shed. Thanking you that you see it and Jesus gave it freely. Because he loves us. He loved his brothers that were sitting in that, in that room, that upper room that he gave this speech to. The same night he loved and warned and strengthened and encouraged and said, this is not all purposeless. This is the great plan I've had from the beginning of time. So that you would redeem us and forgive us, give us new life. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Prayer team, if you can go ahead and come down. We're going to have folks uh, up here at the altar in the back that want to pray with you. If, you. if something, either through the songs, the worship, and the, in the message, something came into you said, man, I need to get that right. I need to change. Please don't wait. Come. There's something powerful when we confess or give someone else strength to, to hold us up. As well, I was told to say this, so I'm going to say it. We had a huge encouragement last week from Johnny and Kim Lowry. How many of y'all just enjoyed their visit? That, that was awesome. About the presence of the Spirit. And then Russ said, go tell John <laughs> Sunday morning. Because Russ isn't here. He said, if you're feeling something that maybe the Lord wants to share in public, go talk to him. So I will be in the back now. I'll, I'll be right here. If you feel something from the Holy Spirit, just share it with me. And uh, we'd love to share it uh, to one another, just to encourage one another with his presence this morning. So please come and respond. We already have, we already have a winner. Come on, come on. Uh, <laughs> come on, man. Hey, guys. Um, just to declare over us that the power of Jesus' blood is greater than depression that you've been facing. His blood is greater than suicide. His blood is greater than cutting and self-harm. His blood is greater than all the self-image things Satan has been um, just tormenting everybody with. His blood is greater than the division and the um, fear and the anger and, the, and everything that's been invading our families. And so I just plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, over each one of you right now. Every place that we've been suffering that the enemy has been taking territory, we declare that is Jesus' territory. We do not receive the enemy's plan for us. We receive Jesus' power. His blood speaks a better word. And so if you are dealing with that, please get prayer. Please get prayer today. He has freedom and life and hope for you. In Jesus' name. That spoke to you, please come pray. Let's worship our King. Let's sing to him, church.
deserve the glory. And all the saints and angels, they bow before you. Sisters, we just ask you to remember that there are people being prayed for at the front. But I want to speak this blessing over you from the book of Jude. And I want you to listen to these beautiful words. Now to him. Now to him. Who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. With great joy. Wow. Wow. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And as Charles Spurgeon used to say, world without end. Amen. Be blessed, church. God bless you.